Hello and welcome to Leaders of Tomorrow, India's only daily television platform for small businesses over the past seven years. We've understood what matters most to you, the entrepreneur, and in year eight, we're taking head on two of your most pressing concerns, that of funding and mentoring. I'm Sunanda Jai Seelan, continuing to put the spotlight on the Dubai market in the special Leaders of Tomorrow series. Tonight, a conversation with Mohammad al Reda of the DHA. We'll also bring you part two of an exclusive sedan conversation with All Cargo where I spoke about the logistics market in depth. Do stay tuned. Let me welcome in uh, Dr. Mohammed, who's joining us here on the show. Uh, Dr. Mohammed, good having you joining us tonight. I do want to talk about what, uh, first up, global health providers can learn about digitizing their health systems from the DHA. Uh, in Dubai Health Authority, uh, I think being an agile government agency, we take pride in being very, very responsive towards customer need, government need, uh, policy makers need, as well as the regional need. Okay. Hence, uh, I think many of our uh, colleagues around us can benefit from our experience uh, from being agile particularly. Um, the digital uh, world, as you know, is quite uh, fast, uh, rapidly changing. If we do not have that characteristic of being agile, I think very, very, very soon we would be uh, not at the forefront. So one of our mandates as uh, Dubai Health Authority is to uh, be uh, a regulator as well as to provide healthcare services and both require agility. We talk very often about the intersection between technology, digital and health here on the show. So as uh, someone who's a doctor, I'm very interested in understanding your perspective uh, about how digital can have a better, in uh, better outcome when it comes to patient health. Your views on that? As a requirement in the uh, surgical room or the operation theater, as some may call it, uh, you need a lot of data, you need a lot of information for you to be able to perform your surgery. Uh, luckily today with the uh, advent and uh, with the improvements that happened around us uh, digitally, we can as surgeons uh, advent and benefit from the uh, plethora of data that's around us. Uh, let's take for example the imaging, uh, the x-ray or the MRI or the CT for example. We can deliver it at the level of a uh, few seconds, at the speed of few seconds, at the theater room while taking it on the spot as well. Um, take that to um, other theater rooms which can be thousands of miles away. These heavy images can be delivered with a split of a second in theater room so that surgeons can benefit from the speed, okay. high resolution, high quality, and the availability of high acuity data at their fingertips. So as a surgeon, I think data and digitalization has helped the world of surgery change so much to the benefit of the patient. This has reflected very well as well on the patient themselves, whereas length of stay in the hospital has been reduced because of length of stay during surgery or the time that it's taken to anesthetize the patient has been reduced dramatically. When we're talking technology, we also very often talk about future technology and how perhaps has the DHA succeeded in using technology like 3D printing, like AI, when it comes to uh, healthcare, what can you tell us? So 3D printing has benefited Dubai Health Authority through multiple proof of concepts that started uh, with the initiative of government of Dubai back in 2016. Uh, one of the early models of 3D printing was the pre-operative kidney model that was printed for a patient who had a very, very deeply seated kidney tumor. This model helped the patient understand what level the tumor was at, as well as help the surgeons understand how to maneuver their way during the surgery. This benefited the surgery a lot in terms of reducing uh, surgery time, reducing uh, the uh, length of stay that the patient had to spend in the, in the uh, hospital post-surgery, as well as saving the entire kidney for the patient. So multiple benefits have been reaped from 3D printing as well as artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence today can be coupled with many, many technologies. We have seen it coupled with uh, images, chest x-rays today taken that have um, huge volume. This artificial intelligence algorithm helped us reduce time and reduce the amount of work that has to be done by the radiologist. Uh, thousands of x-rays, as you can imagine, 
have been run through the algorithm with 97% specificity, 97% uh, accuracy. So 3D printing and artificial intelligence have both helped reduce time, improve quality, reduce cost, reduce dependency on manpower, and eventually led to patient happiness. I want to talk about the opportunities available for uh, Indian startups and tech companies with the DHA and you know any sort of tech products or services that you think uh, can be mutually beneficial as far as the DHA is concerned. We are particularly proud of the Indian startups that we have visited and seen uh, during our recent visit to India. Uh, many of them are quite innovative, not only in their solution, but also in their cost uh, that they present themselves. As well as being at the forefront of technology, I think there is a huge potential for Indian startups to be available in the United Arab Emirates. Multiple programs have been initiated by the government of the United Arab Emirates for startups to be incubated, to be accelerated, to be present in our field, specifically in healthcare. And we have seen amazing technology from all over the world. I think it is an opportunity for Indian technology companies and startups to be present today as the uh, government support program is huge and promising a lot. While we have you with us, I do also want to understand any regulation that you can uh, run our viewers through for any Indian company that perhaps wants to do business in the region. What can you tell them? As government and as Dubai Health Authority, we're very careful about over-regulating or under-regulating. As you may know, that today, government of Dubai is promising to be one of the fastest government in providing services. Uh, this reflects, in turn, on regulation and regulating investments in this very, very high potential field in the United Arab Emirates and specifically in Dubai. Okay. Investors shouldn't worry about um, over-regulation in the sector specifically. Investors should enjoy being able to provide new innovative products in this highly promising sector as well as be able to enjoy uh, a good healthy return on investment. Using technology, what can you tell us about how the DHA has perhaps helped in improving uh, service standards whether you're talking about hospital care or individual patient care as well? So many regulations have been put in to regulate uh, telehealth and that policy has been out for a few years right now, servicing patients. The benefit for the patient is for them not to leave their home, to have the service available at their fingertips at their home. Okay. Speed is required, cost as well reduction is required. However, we do not give any, any um, uh, forgiveness or any compromise when it comes to reducing the level of quality. We promise that the quality will always be there at the same level as if the patient was receiving the service at home. One last question then, it was uh, recently announced, I understand, that DHA in Abu Dhabi will work towards an international healthcare model. What more can you tell us on that? Dubai Health Authority enjoys a healthy relationship, an open communication relationship with all authorities that are around us, specifically Department of Health and Ministry of Health and Prevention. Um, one of our objectives with uh, the Department of Health in Abu Dhabi is to work on the medical education and residency partnerships as well as insurance programs, regulation programs. We all share common challenges and we all strive to learn from each other in terms of providing solutions. Dr. Mohammed, thank you very much for taking the time here on The Leaders of Tomorrow. All right, let's slip into a short break. On that note, on the other side, part two of an exclusive sit-down conversation with Shashi Kiran Shetty of All Cargo. Do stay tuned. Back in just a moment. Welcome back with us here on Leaders of Tomorrow and Tonight, part two of an exclusive sit-down conversation with the chairman of All Cargo. Take a listen to a slice of a very fascinating conversation I did with the chairman of All Cargo where I spoke to him in part one about his entrepreneurial journey and in the second part to talk about the big picture as far as the logistics market is concerned and where he sees his headed, where the big opportunities are and what are the trends for entrepreneurs that he wants to leave our viewers with. Take a listen. Out of India, we load to about 50 different destinations every week cargo going directly mm -hmm. and in some of the boxes there are cargo belongs to different destinations which we 
use hub and spoke methodology sure. to distribute the cargo to the final destination. Sure. Um, but the most important part of uh, our journey has been, I can name a lot, but uh, the main ones are building a global company uh, from India through acquisitions. Sure. Uh, we've been talking all along about the opportunity in the domestic market. Uh, I do quickly also want to talk about, from your experience, given your uh, global footprint, uh, the opportunities that an India-based cargo logistics company can perhaps tap into when it comes to the global markets. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, Indian companies uh, must increasingly look at looking beyond India, right? Uh, yes, when you look beyond India, you then have to have a different mindset, yeah. right? So you've got to have a mindset of building systems and processes, sure. financial discipline, having uh, top class professionals, professional sure. team, uh, sure. systems and processes. Uh, so that needs a very different uh, thing uh, as an entrepreneur one need to uh, carry together. Uh, obviously when you go international, you are going to deal with large global multinational companies or mid-sized companies where they want, to, want your vendor to talk their language. Sure. Right? So, um, but it's all doable. Uh, you learn along the way. You don't have to be fully prepared for it, but it should be a, a, a quick learner. And uh, you know, uh, if you look at the German companies or American companies or British company, they, they, their markets are so small, so they had no choice but to go out uh, to, to sell their products or services, sure. uh, their innovations. Right? Obviously, the other, other very, very important thing is the innovation. Internally, innovation is not necessarily scientific related. Innovation could be how you can be more efficient as an organization, uh, how you can acquire customers uh, with the minimum cost sure. and, and faster turnaround of your cargo. So those kind of innovations can happen internally, right? So I think your, your organization need to promote a lot of innovations internally. Uh, and I think as an Indian company, you can do it. I mean, if I have been able to do it, I'm sure many others can do it. Yeah. Uh, I think it needs uh, the ambition, uh, needs the courage, and needs the drive and financial and other, you know, uh, other components that is required to build a global organization. And uh, I, would, I would really encourage uh, the small and medium enterprises to think hard and look at opportunities uh, beyond your uh, immediate geography. As we're running out of time on this interview, I do want to talk about some of the things that you are passionate about. And uh, one of that is uh, the multiple CSR activities, if I can call it that, that you're passionate about. Uh, one of which is giving back to the environment. You also look very closely at education, yeah. women's empowerment. Why, do you, why for you and why yeah. according to you is it important for business leaders like yourself yeah. to be involved in giving back and to be you know, sort of publicly talking about what it is you're doing? Yeah, I think first of all, uh, I've been uh, grown up in an environment where we've been brought up with a lot of love, uh, dedication, and uh, my father was particularly, was very helpful as a person to the community. So I saw all these things at a very young age. And, uh, you know, we also as a family st stuck together, uh, cousins and brothers and sisters, we're all extremely close to each other. Uh, and personally, I myself have been uh, always believed in helping and giving from a very young days. Um, you know, I'm always very much connected to some of my friends uh, who I have not forgotten, uh, people who helped me. I'm very grateful for, for what people have done. And I love nature, and that comes naturally uh, to, to do anything related to environment uh, and cleanliness. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, and I think it's very important, uh, end of the day, uh, what's the use of money unless you spend it? You know, what you leave behind is going to be spent by somebody else. So in your lifetime, you spend as much uh, uh, in, in the right things, right? So I, I believe in, uh, in, in that quite a bit. And uh, CSR became more formalized in the last few years, but uh, uh, we in the company have always been uh, helping the, the community uh, who gets, um, uh, who we come across from time to time, uh, who needs help, right? And particularly in the areas where we operate, uh, there is so much of poverty and so much of uh, deprivation, and we build a community around that. So that also helps us in terms of the goodwill that you build 
uh, in the area where you operate. Um, so I think you know these are the main drivers. I'm very passionate about it, uh, and I, I always believe in having a quality life. Uh, I, I I also believe in having uh, minimum litigation, uh, n uh, minimum tax uh, issues in your organization or personally. Uh, I like, uh, you know, things are systematically uh, done in the organization so that you, s you, you are, you, ha you hit, I don't like surprises. Uh, so I try to safeguard whatever best I can sure. in that context here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, very quickly, I do also want to touch upon the fact that, uh, you know, uh, your family is involved. Uh, in your business as well. <coughs> most of the entrepreneurs we speak to, uh, most small businesses across the world, in fact, are family owned and family run. What lessons have you learned working closely with family? What lessons would you like to give our viewers? Yeah, you know, I think in family, uh, it's very important that, uh, you know, you uh, tell your family member uh, or not necessarily tell, you know, organize in such a way okay. that each one of them know what they are responsible for. Sure. and. Uh, the, the relationship within the organization is like of, an, like of a professional, right? Every, you know, each one are given a responsibility and they're responsible for it. Uh, outside the office, you're really a family member. But uh, what also happens is uh, I've been blessed with family members who are very dedicated, extremely hardworking, and uh, follow the value system of uh, what we set within the organization. So I have no real challenges. I think it's end of the day how you mold your family members also in the organization. Yeah. And I always create an environment where the family members and professionals work together. Uh, so when the responsibility is properly, um, you know, properly articulated, then everything starts working in, in tandem because yeah. it's a teamwork, end of the day, right? Not one person can do everything. You need people, you need to have that culture in the organization of team spirit. Um, and, uh, you know, I also believe that uh, setting a good culture in the organization is the sure. only way you can sustain any organization, sure. right? So sustainability is very important for me. I always build those safeguards so the, the company survives beyond me. That's how it is. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my last question to you, Mr. Shetty. Um, one thing you perhaps want to leave our viewers with by way of advice. Yeah, I think most important thing uh, is do the right thing. You know, I think listen to your inner voice and uh, look at the future, make investment for the future. Uh, no business is stable. Business always goes through a cycle, ups and downs. Sure. Uh, so one has to, uh, uh, you know, think about how do you ride those waves, right? And uh, how do you uh, make sure that you have a great reputation? People underestimate the value of a reputation, okay. perception, sure. right? The reputation, the perception is very, very important that helps in your favor with customers, with, with your staff, with your vendors. Uh, it, it builds that uh, ecosystem. And uh, the other piece of advice is don't become overly ambitious. Be ambitious, but don't become greedy, okay. right? So the greed drives you into doing wrong things and uh, also in terms of financial mismanagement. And that's what takes companies down. Okay. So. It's been a fascinating conversation. Thank you. Shashi Kiran. Shetty, thank you very much for your time here. Thank you show. very much. Thank thank you. It's a pleasure. Completely out of time on this episode of Leaders of Tomorrow. If you have any feedback for us, our contact details coming up on your screens in just a moment. Just stay tuned.